Hey there, I'm Mike Rignetta. Welcome to The Salon. This is Mental Floss Video. And did you know that about 32 million people attend one or more music festivals in the US each year? It's true. According to Nielsen data, about 46% of those people are between the ages of 18 and 34. And that there is the first of many facts about music festivals that I'm gonna tell you about today because it's summertime, you might be going to one soon and need some fun facts to share while you're sitting in the heat waiting for Kanye to take the stage. <laughs> Music festivals might seem like a new phenomenon, but they've actually been relevant throughout much of history. Many experts cite the Pythian Games in ancient Greece as one early example of a music festival. It's estimated that these started around 582 BCE and were a way for the Greeks to honor Apollo. They involved athletic contests and musical competitions. Jumping forward in time, in 1872, the Franco-Prussian War officially ended, and in Boston, this was commemorated with an event called the World's Peace Jubilee and International Music Festival. Famous conductor Johann Strauss II performed. Other historic music festival occurred in 1938. At Carnegie Hall, the From Spirituals to Swing concert featured performances from many African-American artists. They essentially went through the history of African-American music, covering everything from spirituals to jazz. The audience also wasn't segregated, which was monumental at the time. The concert was such a success that they did it again the next year. The Watts Dax Festival in 1972 was another important music festival in African-American history. You've probably heard of the Watts Riots. In 1965, 34 people died in the Watts neighborhood of LA within about a week. So a few years later, to help mend the area's reputation, Al Bell of Stax Records planned a music festival. 112,000 people attended to watch performances by Isaac Hayes, Albert King, the Staple Singers, and more. It's often referred to as Black Woodstock. Thousands of dollars were raised for the Watts community. Then, of course, we have one of the most famous music festivals of all time, Woodstock in 1969. It's notorious for a few reasons, like its epic lineup of musicians featuring The Who, Santana, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and many, many more. And the rain and mud made for some incredible pictures. Plus, it's often viewed as a representation of counterculture in the 1960s. The festival lasted for three days, and it's estimated that half a million people were there. It's also worth noting that there were zero incidents of violence. Zero reported, at least. By the time Jimi Hendrix took the stage and performed his now infamous version of the national anthem, less than half the audience was there. The festival had spilled out onto the fourth day. It was originally supposed to be a three-day event, so Hendrix was playing to a smaller 9 a.m. Monday morning crowd. Man, what a way to start your week. If we're gonna talk about Woodstock, we have to give at least some credit to the Monterey Pop Festival, which took place in Monterey, California in June of 1967, two years before for Woodstock. And it actually had a lot of the same performers, including The Who, Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin. It just doesn't get talked about as much because there were only somewhere around 100,000 people in attendance, and also, there was no mud. And even one weekend before that was what's considered the world's first rock festival, the Fantasy Fair and Magic Mountain Festival in Marin County, California. Performers included The Doors, Jefferson Airplane, and Dionne Warwick. And that is a rock fact. In 1965, Bob Dylan played the Newport Folk Festival. He was actually there the year before playing his acoustic songs, but in 65, he switched to an electric guitar with a more rock and roll sound, and the audience booed him showing up to a folk music festival with an electric guitar. What are you doing? Jumping forward a few decades, Live Aid happened in 1985. It raised money for an Ethiopian famine relief fund. The cool thing about Live Aid was that there were two concerts going on at the same time, one in London and one in Philadelphia. Live Aid aired on TV and the feed would switch back and forth between the two locations. London had performances by Queen, David Bowie, and The Who at Wembley Stadium and at JFK Stadium in Philly. Performers included Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Run DMC, Madonna, and Mick Jagger. Not everyone was there though. Rumor has it that Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder boycotted Live Aid. It said that they were disappointed by the lack of diversity at the event. You've probably heard of Coachella, the Californian music festival. The first one was in 1999, featuring Beck, Morrissey, Rage Against the Machine, and more. Despite those famous performers, though, it's estimated that the festival lost $800,000 that first year. Years later, Coachella wanted to reunite some 
of the Smiths, whose frontman Morrissey is a huge animal rights activist and once complained about all of the barbecue at the music festival. And in a 2012 interview with the Herald Sun, he claimed, the agents for Coachella offered a 100% vegetarian event for the following year if I would agree to headline with Johnny Marr as the Smiths. Fascinatingly, they made it clear that they would not require the Smiths' bass player or drummer. Prince played Coachella in 2008 and did a cover of the song Creep by Radiohead. All videos of the performance were taken off of YouTube eventually. An interviewer later asked Tom York of Radiohead about it and York said, he's blocked it? Well, tell him to unblock it. It's our song. Another famous Coachella moment occurred when a hologram, which was actually an optical illusion, stole the show. In 2012, Dr. Dre performed alongside a hologram of Tupac Shakur. It was created by a company called Digital Domain, the same one that did the CGI for the curious case of Benjamin Button. Moving on to Bonnaroo, around 55% of the people who attend the Tennessee Music Festival travel 500 miles or more to get there. One of the coolest parts of Bonnaroo is the fountain. Each year, the festival organizers recruit an artist to paint it, so it's different every festival. Then there's Lollapalooza in Chicago, which was founded by Perry Farrell, the lead singer of Jane's Addiction. Farrell claimed to have heard the word Lollapalooza in a Three Stooges short and chose it as the name for his event. A close second was <laughs> Another festival organizer, Sharon Osborne, Ozzy's wife. The story goes that Ozzy was snubbed from the Lollapalooza tour in 1996, so Sharon started Ozfest which incidentally I went to five times as a youngin. I saw a lot of Slipknot concerts. But a decade earlier in 1987, South by Southwest had its first conference. Nowadays, about 28,000 people flock to South by for their music conference. In the first year, they had just 700 attendees. Since then, they've also branched out with interactive film and education conferences. South by Southwest was started by the Austin Chronicle. It took hours of brainstorming for them to come up with a name. They discussed calling it Third Coast at one point. In 1968, the Isle of Wight Festival was held in England to raise money for a local swimming pool. Attendance jumped from 15,000 that year to 600,000 in 1970, thanks to performances by The Doors, The Who, Joni Mitchell, and other legends. Because of that huge crowd, the festival was banned for three decades. It made its comeback in 2002. Let's move on to some music festivals with unique themes, like the annual Quiet Music Festival of Portland, Oregon. Rather than loud rock music, they feature acts which play quiet, soothing music. The Lower Keys Music Festival has taken place in the Florida Keys annually for about 30 years. It's a little different because it takes place underwater. People dive and snorkel in a particular area where music gets played. The music is specifically curated so that it is detectable and enjoyable in the ocean. Back to more traditional festivals like Glastonbury in England. This festival started in 1970 with a very different name, the Pilton Pop Blues and Folk Festival. An estimated 1,500 people were there. Nowadays, after Glastonbury, about 5,500 tents get abandoned at the grounds. And I don't want to make it seem like music festivals only happen in Europe and North America. In Russia, they have Nashestvia, which is known as the Russian Woodstock. It has happened every year right by Moscow since 1999. It was founded by a local radio station. There are a few major music festivals in Japan, too, like the Fuji Rock Festival. Name a popular band, and they have probably been there. Coldplay, Foo Fighters, White Stripes, Muse, the list goes on. There's also the Summer Sonic Festival in Japan, which is cool because it's a two to three day festival that happens in two locations, Osaka and Chiba. Usually a band will play in both places over the course of the festival. Finally, I return to the salon to tell you that in 2015, the blog Tick IQ calculated the ticket value of 11 different music festivals. They used a few different methods, like comparing face value ticket prices to concert tickets for the headliners. Rock and Rio was the best value in that sense. Tickets were $258, but the headliners were Taylor Swift, Bruno Mars, Ed Sheeran, John Legend, and Sam Smith. To see all of those artists separately, you would have to spend about $200. If you're looking for value per band, in which they divided ticket prices by how many bands were playing, Wakarusa in Arkansas was the winner. In 2015, they had 138 bands and tickets were $204. That's $1.48 per band. What a deal. Thanks for watching Mental Floss Video, which is made with the help of all of these very nice people. If you're gonna go to a music festival this summer, let me know which one in the comments. I've always wanted to go to Iceland Airwaves or the Unsound Festival in Poland. Maybe this year is my year. And also, don't forget to be awesome.